is the world coming to an end? This is how you'd feel. Um, okay, I have a couple of, oh, yes, right first. What? Oh, okay. Um, and Jesse, because I was traveling, I did not get a chance to look at your paper. I'm sorry. I will try to look at both of your papers. I will try. No, you were braced. You were braced for it. Um, is anybody, so it's fine to be bringing them a little early. Does anybody need any help? Does anybody need advice or help on their paper? This is my weekly. You have two more weeks. I just got to sift through the massive amount of information. It's a lot. And you know what? Here's the thing. Um, trimming and editing is an educational process too. So part of what I'm asking you to do is go through like a thousand pages of a poem and choose the highlights. And of course, highlights, it's subject to opinion. Do you know what I mean? Your highlights don't have to be my highlights, but just sort of an overview. Um, and uh, choosing what to include and what to not include is part of the process. So if you're finding that difficult, this is not a bad thing because it's a practice. It's practicing a skill that we all use all the time, even when we're not writing papers. You know what I mean? You just have to sort of cut through what's not essential and get to the heart of something. And we use this in life all the time. So it's it's a good thing. Yeah, go ahead. Um, in purgatory, weren't the three sins that like uh, Dante kind of wrote in that also like affected him that he suffered? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wasn't that wrath, pride, and... Lust. He went through the fire of lust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. To... Um, another thing, this is just random news here at the beginning. Um, I have made an editorial decision because you guys don't have as many weeks, you know, you know the drill that if you've been in here for several years, I always have an extra week hanging out there that you can watch the video for, but I know a lot of you don't because, you know, maybe school is over and your summer is starting and you're traveling or whatever. I know it doesn't happen. So I wanted to make sure we did the Shakespeare plays. Next week we are reading Hamlet. We are skipping up. It's week 29 in your reading guide, we are not reading Machiavelli's The Prince. So here's the deal. If you, I'm sorry, Hannah, but here's the thing. I will do The Prince my extra week. Do you know what I mean? And you can watch the video, which is like really into Machiavelli, but it was more important to me that we did Hamlet and Henry V than it was that we did The Prince. And I had to make a decision for you guys. Also, um, well, anyway. So read Hamlet. Um, we're going to read the whole play. Here's what I've done for you guys. Um, I, just like I did for Julius Caesar and Macbeth, I've been in my library with my little camera reading Mac Hamlet for you. And it's all posted on YouTube on a playlist. Uh, I sent your parents a link to the playlist. YouTube is not smart enough to put Act 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in order. I am going to trust that you're smart enough to know that Act 1 comes before Act 2. Please, read it in the order of the numbers, not in the order that YouTube thinks you should apparently arrange them in a playlist. Um, you do not have to watch my video. It's okay. I did it so that you can follow along with me if you would like things explained. I'm not explaining in Hamlet because none of us have that kind of kind of time, right? Um, basically, if you got on and read with me an hour a day for the next week, you've read Hamlet. Um, yeah, read. Did you do it live? Or no, no, I recorded them and okay, uploaded I, them. I, I just hopped on YouTube and it said, Miss Ferguson, act, I don't know which act. Oh, was, yeah. Oh, okay. Like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I uploaded them at my parents because they have really good internet. Um, so, and I've started, I, we're going to do Henry V. I've started, and you read Henry V with me, but I did a terrible job. Four years ago, we'll do. It'll be much better this time. But you should watch, read these over and over again, anyway. Um, and I'm I'm starting. I've already done the prologue in Act One of Henry V for the next time. But anyway, I what I do is I read it and then I stop occasionally and say, "Well, do you remember what's going on?" Don't you know? Or I explain some obscure passage. Like, well, what he really means is, I went through the to be or not to be. Maybe you're familiar that Hamlet gives a speech that starts to be or not to be, and I and that's a pretty important part of the play. 
So I stopped and talked about well, what's he really saying? Because what I'd like to do when we come together is not so much talk about the plot, because it's not a difficult plot to follow. What I'd like to talk about is how Shakespeare presented it and how things are connected and that sort of thing. So I've given you questions in your book. If you want to just get your book and read it to yourself, it's totally fine with me. But if you would like a little help, the link is in the parents email that I already sent out this morning. Just click on YouTube and just sit down with your book and follow along. The nice thing is if you, you know, you can pause me and go, you know, get another drink or read the footnote, you know, because you're not following or whatever. Um, that is up to your discretion. I also highly recommended to your parents that you see it. Um, it's not supposed to just be read. It's not a book. It's a play. People act it out. And it makes more sense when you see people acting it out. So sometimes in the video, there's a part where a lady is giving flowers to everybody and she's telling you what she's giving. And I, so I said on the video, she's got flowers and she's handing out flowers. But if you see it in a play, well, it makes total sense. And I recommended a couple of them. There are a lot of versions of Hamlet. I have not seen very many of them at all. Um, I love uh, the BBC Shakespeare plays. Um, that I was told years ago, if you have BritBox, if you have a, you know, the cable or something, whatever BritBox is on, um, I think all of those are on there. And Derek Jacobi, who's the greatest actor in the history of the world, um, uh, is Hamlet in that one. Uh, and it's, it's just a filmed stage play. Do you know what I mean? It hasn't got fancy sets or castles or anything. It's just like they're on a stage. Um, but it's very good. And Patrick Stewart is... Um, Claudia, um, Claudius the King. So if you're a Star Trek Next Gen fan or X-Men fan or something, you can watch Patrick Stewart be evil. Um, and Kenneth Branagh also did a super long, super long Hamlet because it's got everything. Um, and it's amazing. And the greatest actor in the world, Derek Jacobi, is the evil king in this one. In the first one, he's Hamlet. In this one, he's aged. And now he's the He's the king. Um, it has a little bit of nudity and some sharp, sudden violence. And so this is just my parent advisory, my teacher advisory. Um, don't just watch things without making sure it's fine with your parents. Um, there's a Mel Gibson handlet. I don't know anything about it. Do you guys know the Mel Gibson? Is it decent? Uh, is he a good Hamlet? It, these guys, but it's got Mel Gibson. It also has Glenn Close, right? Uh, is she Gertrude? It's also got um, the gal who plays the, uh, Mrs. Hamlet's mother. Oh, Ophelia is a very young. What's the gal who plays the the bad witch lady in the Harry Potter Potter series with the black hair? Oh, oh Helena Helena Bonham, Bonham Carter. Bell, yeah, yeah, she plays Ophelia. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. So I remember liking it, but I didn't. Also okay. Have a very good okay, the BBC version. Ophelia is. Um, she was one of Doctor Who's companions, Lala Ward, who was married to Tom Baker for a while. Anyway, this has nothing to do with anything that we're talking about. This is trivia. This is Hamlet movie trivia. Um, so watch all try, try, I mean, it's not a bad idea to watch many versions. Um, the, the Kenneth Branagh movie version is not set in the middle ages. It's more like a eight, 19th century Europe yeah. vibe going, um, which I not, I didn't like once upon a time, but now I kind of like, but the Mel Gibson one's very dark. So, so I just urge you to seek out a version Go to the library, see what's streaming on whatever you have available at home, because it is meant to be seen. It is not meant to be read. It's a script. It's not a book. But we'll start with at least knowing what's going on. It helps you to watch it when you kind of know what they're saying and what's going on. Okay, that's enough of that. This is true, but it's not quite the same because you're supposed they're meant to be seen. We're not supposed to read the stage directions. You know, enter. So and so enters. I flourish sounds. We're not supposed to read that. Um, okay, because of time constraints, one more thing. Um, this is the it's tiny. Uh, this is another illustration from a book of the hours. 
the prayer books that people would have in their homes. I mean, they have them in monasteries and churches, but people would do this at home. They would set, have prayers that they pray at set hours of the day, and they would illustrate them if you have money. They hire somebody to illustrate it beautifully. And so this, um, my pathetic lack of French, it's called the Trey Riche Ur. The very rich hours is what it means. And rich doesn't mean with money. It means full of activity in life. And uh, this is a very famous book of the hours. Um, uh, and it's illustrated with scenes from sort of like farm life throughout the year. And so the top has the zodiac because it's showing you what time of year it is. And then in this particular one, you might be able to see there's snow on the ground. And uh, there's this lady down here and she's got a fire and she's lifting up her skirt to, to like warmer ankles at the fire. It's just these cute little details. So I'm, I'll put it here for you on the way out just because we're of time. Um, anyway, I've got another one from another season to bring next week. But um, this, this was probably made during Chaucer's lifetime, this particular book of the hours. Um, and it, it belonged to some French duke, the Duke de Berry, that I know nothing about. Um, okay, one last cool thing and then we'll actually talk. This is about the Canterbury Tales now, but it's not about what you read this week. So it turns out that social media is actually good for something. Who would have known that it actually had a purpose? And the purpose is the fact that I have almost no Facebook friends because I keep unfriending people. Um, I just don't, not that many people need to know my business, I'm just going to say. And so like, if I haven't seen you in a while, you leave. And uh, so that means I don't have a lot that comes up on my newsfeed. So I get stuff like poetry and, you know, trivia about the Three Stooges or wh whatever I have clicked on. And early, well, it was late last week, I'm on Facebook and a T.S. Eliot poem comes up on my Facebook feed. Okay, so T.S. Eliot is a famous 20th century British poet. You may know him as the author of all the, the words to all the songs in the musical Cats. T.S. Eliot wrote all those poems. Those were poems before the musical. It's called Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats by T.S. Eliot. And there's many, many more poems about the cats. And Andrew Lloyd Webber took those and set them to music. There's another T.S. Eliot poem that is also the source of the beautiful song in that musical memory. It's T.S. Eliot words. But that's not what he was most famous for. He wrote a poem called The Wasteland. Now, some of you read the King Arthur book with me, and you might remember that the wasteland was the thing they called the, the area around that castle Carbonek, where the dolorous stroke was struck and Balin used the lance from the crucifixion. Some of you are like, she's having a stroke. She's not making sense at all anymore. No. Um, okay. Did some, like nod. Do some of you read this book with me? Like, does anybody in here remember this? Um, okay. Well, there was this castle that would disappear and reappear. The castle, of, the haunted castle of Carbonek. It's a thing. And they, the area where it was was the wasteland. T.S. Eliot took this idea and he, he made it be about the aftermath of World War I. That's what the wasteland is about. But I'm finally getting to the point, I promise you. The very beginning of The Wasteland came up on Facebook, and I read this. I'm going to read just a few lines. You tell me why I'm reading it. You tell me why it jumped out at me. All right, we'll see if you make the connection. April is the cruelest month. Breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Um, summer surprised us, coming over the Starn Burger Sea with a shower of rain. We stopped in the colonnade, went on in sunlight into the Hof Garden, drank coffee, talked for an hour. But he goes on and on. I'm going to stop there. April is the cruelest month. You know, winter kept us warm. What's the connection? 
T.S. Eliot is talking back to Chaucer. What does Chaucer say? When in April, the sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the root, and all the veins are bathed in liquor of such power as brings about the engendering of the flower. All right, we already read it. We read it aloud last week. Chaucer says, you know, April, when everything is awesome, people get lively and the flowers start growing and it's cool. He says, you know, in April, that cruelest month, you know, we were all cuddled up and warm in the winter. That cold rain, those showers that come, it's miserable. He's talking to him. He's talking back to Chaucer over 600 years. Now, here's the thing. If I can't sell it today, I, you know, I should be, do an infomercial or something right here for the great books. All of these people, some of you, Karsten, you've been on a long ride with me. You've been for four, this is your fourth year riding along with me on this. These people are talking to each other. All these authors. It's the VIP club. And Dante is talking to Homer. Remember? He's like, oh, you know that Odysseus, that Ulysses? Well, now he's going to be in hell for being a false counselor. And then Alfred Lord Tennyson, a few hundred years later, says, oh, you know that Ulysses? Yeah, we're going to do a poem. You know, we're going to make him sound awesome, even though Dante made him sound like a loser. And Homer, for Homer, he was the hero who just wants to get home. He doesn't want to go roaming. He wants to go home. They're talking to each other. And when you start reading all this stuff, suddenly it starts to hit you. They're having a conversation, and Rhett said it. I've got the VIP ticket to get in on it. Mortimer Adler, who wrote How to Read a Book, he calls it the great conversation, the one that's happening for millennia. And it's a super duper, it's not a secret club. I was going to say super duper secret club. It is today because nobody reads. Nobody reads the stuff I'm asking you to read. You guys got your ticket in. And now you can see, like Charlotte did, oh my gosh, April is fabulous. April stinks. It's not a coincidence that he started his great poem the way Chaucer starts his great poem. These things are not a coincidence. And you will start to see them more and more as you read stuff again and again. I'm reading Pilgrim's Progress. I just finished Pilgrim's Progress again because that's what we're reading next year. We just read about a spiritual journey. Dante took a journey. John Bunyan's journey was different than Dante's journey. Dante is, is Catholic. Bunyan is a Puritan. But they're talking to each other. Well, one is talking to the other, right? And we get in on it. So anyway, that's my sales pitch. It's, we read this stuff because it's amazing. But it also gives you a ticket in. There's a conversation. Humanity is having a conversation. And you guys are getting the ticket in. But you live among a people who don't. They, don't. they don't think anybody who's not alive today is still having a conversation. But they are. They are. So anyway, I'm sorry. I get excited about these things. I get super excited. When I, I read and it didn't say anything about Chaucer. It just had that beginning to the wasteland. But it struck me suddenly. I don't know a lot about T.S. Eliot. I haven't read The Wasteland all the way. But it just amazed me. I thought, oh my gosh. Will now. I will now. I've been saying I need to concentrate on a, a T.S. Eliot summer or something. Yeah, it was for a library sale. So one of them in my library sales. Okay, let's take a look at the Canterbury Tales that you read for this week. Um, we started with the Prioress's Tale. What, what kind of woman... Did we say she was when we read about her in the prologue? Can you describe? Wasn't she the prim lady, the um, prissy? The yeah, prissy is what we called her. Yeah. Um, she's, got, she's got the veil. She's got the there's no grease. And she's got the little dog. And she feeds a little dog. <clears throat> and she has the little bracelet that says, Love conquers all, even though she's the head of a convent. And so, do you remember how she feels when somebody, like when she sees a ma mouse caught in a trap or somebody is mean to her dog? Oh. <laughs> so and so, is there anything 
interesting about the fact, I mean, how does the story she told, which is just a ghastly story about a little boy having his throat cut. Oh my goodness. Um, how does her story match her person? Well, she's or very, do you think it does? very emotional. She's very emotional. This is, this, that is, that was dark. No, that was a dark story. I that think, was I think so it's not supposed to match. I think it's supposed to be Do you think? The thing about it is that we think she's like prim and prissy and all that stuff. But in this tale, you can see that on the inside, there are still, there's still that, I don't know. Darkness. Humanity. Humanity and Christ-like spirit. Mm. Even, is it because she feels grieved at this incident is that what you mean that's what i that's that's the tone i'm seeing here i i will be totally honest i saw it the other way i thought she was telling it just to get tears like from total sentimentality but i am not saying you guys are are not correct it could be both are true at the same time that she's familiar with a seedy underbelly however let me read something to you and it might it might change your perspective just a little bit. So this history book, <laughs> now, this is just, it's an 11 volume set. It's awesome. Will and Ariel Durant's History of Story of Civilization. I got it all for like 10 bucks, all 11 volumes at the Moline Library. Moline Library, book sale. Some guy said, are you going to read all those? Yeah. Okay. So, and I did. They were really good. Okay. So although he's not a Christian and it, it bubbles through. Sometimes he's a little bit snarky. Um, okay, listen to this. First of all, let me uh, preface it with the, the idea that um, I think we've talked about, with some of you when you were younger, I know we talked about this, um, because some of you read the Chaucer storybook with me. If you read the King Arthur book, you read the Chaucer storybook. And um, they called the story Little Hugh of Lincoln. Okay, Little Hugh of Lincoln. Do you remember that? Oh, okay, awesome. So, and we talked about the fact that they hated Jews in the Middle Ages. The Jews were constantly being um, uh, banished from, from particular countries, um, partially because the Jews were not forbidden by their religion to charge interest on loans, <clears throat> like uh, the Christians were. Usury was not wrong for Jews. So they made a lot of money lending money at interest. Somebody asked yesterday where they start out with the money. Unclear. Unclear. But once they had the money, they lent it at interest. And so a lot of people were in debt to Jews and it ticked them off. Um, so I want to read to you. This is a little section about relationship with the Jews in the Middle Ages. Okay. But there's a, and it's, it's kind of longish. I'm going to skip through some of it, but there's a particular moment and I'll emphasize it, you know, that I want you to, to notice. Okay. This is a heavy book. I'm going to leave it down here. Um, some, oh, it tells you, first of all, it reminds you that J the Jews of England excluded from land holding and from the guilds. Jews were not allowed to own land. Jews were not allowed to be in the craft guilds of the Middle Ages. So they couldn't be blacksmiths. It was like a trade union, a little bit. And you couldn't practice that trade without being in the guild. And Jews weren't allowed. So what are you going to do for a living? It says, since they were excluded, they became merchants and financiers. Some waxed rich through usury, and all were hated for it. Lords and squires equipped themselves for the Crusades with money borrowed from the Jews. In return, they pledged the revenues of their lands, and the Christian peasant fumed at the thought of moneylenders fattening on his toil. You know, the lord of the manor has got, raised money for his crusade by borrowing from Jews, and now I'm a peasant left on the land and I'm working and I know all the work is going to go to Jews because they basically hold the mortgage on it now, you know, because of borrowed money. In 1144, young William of Norwich was found dead. The Jews were accused of having killed him to use his blood and the Jewish quarter of the city was sacked and fired. Uh, they thought that Jews used Christian blood for ceremonial purposes. Um, they did it. Uh, King Henry II protected the Jews. Henry III did likewise, but took 422,000 pounds from them in taxes and capital levies in seven years. At the coronation of Richard I in London, there was a minor altercation encouraged by nobles seeking to escape from their debts to Jews. 
and it developed into a pogrom that spread into Lincoln, Stamford, and Lynn. Um, so in other words, we're going to wipe out the Jews. Pogrom. Um, okay, I'm going to skip down. In 1255, this is the important part, rumors spread through Lincoln that a boy named Hugh had been enticed into the Jewish quarter and there had been scourged, crucified, and pierced with a lance in the presence of a rejoicing Jewish crowd. This did not happen. I mean, I'm, I don't know it didn't happen. I'm like 99.98% .98 sure this didn't happen. Um, armed bands invaded the settlement, seized the rabbi who was supposed to have presided over the ceremony, tied him to the tail of a horse, dragged him through the streets, and hanged him. 91 Jews were arrested, 18 were hanged. This is the incident of little Hugh of Lincoln. Now, in the, in the Chaucer says in Asia, right? But this is why they call it little Hugh of Lincoln in that Chaucer storybook. This is the incident. It's an actual historical incident. Okay, Rhett, go for it. Wasn't it? Wasn't the little Hugh of Lincoln? Wasn't it like the Hugh of Lincoln? Yes, yes. So, I mean, these are embellished. Obviously, these are stories. But it's based on a historical incident. Um, this, so the, this particular tale is based on a historical incident. And this was just um, common belief that Jews would kill Christians. That, that was the rumor. So now, if you know that, if you know that this is just a proverbial thing, you know, you know how the Jews killed the Christian little kids. Now, does it make the prioress's tale seem a little less sordid? I mean, like like le less of the underbelly? She's just, you know, you know, it was one of those times. You know, how they do when they kill kids. It wasn't that this story was meant to be shocking. It wasn't going to be shocking to anyone because it's like, you know, when that happens. It's a thing that happens, but it's not a thing that happens. <laughs> Does it, do you see what I mean? Does that, and maybe it doesn't change how you feel, but do, does it change? Oh, the prioress is rather dark and gloomy and alley that nobody knows about. Does it change how you feel to know that everybody knew about this? This was, this was common. So that's why I was leaning towards maybe she's just trying to get a little, oh, poor little boy, you know, trying to get some tears going not mocking. It, it would be terrible, but it's a terrible story. But I, I was thinking more, maybe she was being a, doing a tearjerker. The widow, you know, the widow mother who loses her only son. And go ahead, Karsten. One thing that I found out, I think it was a couple of years back, um, and like during my Bible study, um, yeah, like the, one of Jesus's trials where, um, I think it's Pilate, washes his hands and says, like, I don't want no part of this. Mm -hmm. and, like the Jewish readers say, yet his blood be on us and our children. It's like, okay. Yeah. So I think to some extent, like, I mean, like, I guess in a sense, they're kind of cursed. It's like, I mean, it, you said hard, his blood be on our heads and our children. And so there you go. I mean, you killed the son of God. So that's a pretty high stake for you. No, this is not a very popular thing in some Christian circles to say, but the church fathers, the earliest church fathers certainly saw it that way. They saw the destru destruction of Jerusalem as direct punishment for that very comment. And of course, people read this and they say, oh, the church fathers were so ignorant. They didn't know we all crucified Jesus because it was our sins. Yes, they did. They did. They knew both. They also knew that Jesus went and he cursed that fig tree and he said, may you never bear figs again. And that fig tree was Israel. May you never bear again. And, and he, he said the same thing in another way when he said, you know, I would have gathered you under my wings like a hen gathers her chicks and you would not come. And, and so it is... The hatred of the Jews throughout history has got to be supernatural. 
Do you know what I mean? There's no reason for everybody in the world to hate this particular group of people to the point of trying to exterminate them on numerous occasions. And what is going on currently in the, in the world is just chapter, I don't know, 85 of the let's, let's exterminate the Jews. And I'm not, all of the people who have persecuted will answer to God for it. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying, well, it's fine. Everybody be mean to the Jews because, you know, they say, they said his blood be on us and on our children. No, they will answer for it. But yet it continues to happen. And I think that there's, there's a supernatural reason why everybody hates the Jews, that they called something down on themselves. That's as, I don't know, theologic, historically, theologically, as I want to go with that. But I, I agree. I agree with what you heard personally. Certainly the earliest church believed it. Um, again, but this is unconscionable, you know, that you accuse a group of people, you know, of murdering children and then just string them up and lynch them. That's also not cool. Um, but yeah, the, the prioress, it, it's interesting, the story I told you, even to the detail that it's a widow lady who has this only son. It's, it's almost designed to make us just weep over this. And of course, the Jews in this, the Jewish quarter in this story are very powerful. You know, they're in charge of their, their area and she's got no power. She's got no, I don't, I, I, well, I wanted to say salvation, but I don't want, I don't mean that in a religious but it is religious, but she's got no um, um, champion. You know, she's got no, no advocate. Um, so Mary becomes her advocate um, in this story because this little boy is devoted to Mary and singing this, oh, Alma Redemptoris, nourisher of our Redeemer. And it's, you know, who's the nourisher of the Redeemer? Mary. So he learns this song about Mary and Mary grants this miracle in the story. How is that part of the story fitting for who she is? Remember who she is and what her job is. How does that part of the story, what does, is there anything about that detail that makes this a good story for her? Well, yeah, but, but what, is, what is her job again? She's, so what does she do? What is her full-time job? Yes. And, and what is their full-time job? Devoting themselves to God. So, you know, we have the story where devotion to God and his mother brings about her. I mean, she's, the boy still dies. Do you know what I mean? But it brings about a, as happy an ending as the story's going to have. Well, he could have been healed, but. The child, the child himself, he it's not just he's, you know, um, you know, provided by a story or anything. He understands that, like, oh, this is my thing. Like, I'm going to die for this, but mm -hmm. so be it. Mm -hmm. Because this is, I'm standing for him and whatever. Yeah. And my miraculous um, singing is going to be a testimony. A testimony to the power of, of God um, to, to preserve us um, and be with us. Um, so, anyway, that that is really... because. We only have like 10 minutes, 15 minutes for each story. Um, I was going to pass on that one unless somebody else wants to bring something up about the Priorists' <sighs> tale about little boys getting their throats cut. Yeah, not very pleasant. Um, okay. Briefly, ever so briefly. Oh, and I... What's, what's the joke? It's a joke. And who is Chaucer again? <laughs> He's the worst storyteller. The host says, oh my gosh, just shut it. You're you're the worst. You're that's hideous. Um, okay, let me let me look it up. Oh, where is it? And then in the in the book that we have yeah, and right after What can I not find it? You have like like recites an entire debate in prose. Oh yes, okay, here we go. Here we go. So yeah, okay, so the that your version does not have the tale of Melaby that he tells in its place. It is not in poetry. And I, I, yeah, it's just like, yeah, but it's not as a poem. It's just kind of, 
No, no, I didn't ask you to read it. So I'm going to tell you about it now. It's, it says it's a really super boring, like it's a sermon on lists of saints. And he says at the end, after the host shuts him down and says, you stink and do something else. I can't listen to this anymore. He says, um, uh, he says, you won't find much by way of difference between the little treatise, the little like tract on saints that he's using for his source. By the way, it's not little. And this, a Mary story of my own. It's not Mary. Some people speculate this is his revenge. It's like, uh, if you're going to shut down my little happy story, I'm going to give you the most ghastly, boring thing I can think of. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's almost worse than the tale of Sir Topaz. So Sir Topaz, it, did you know this? Okay, let me read the, the stanza before it starts. I'm going to read it poorly, but for purpose. Say something now as other folk have done, and let it be a tale of mirth at once. Host, I replied, I hope you are not one to take it in bed part if I'm a dunce. Right, I am big pentameter. Then listen to the tale of Sir Topaz. Listen, lords, with all your might, and I will tell you honor bright a tale of mirth and game. About a fair and gentle knight in battle tournament and fight, Sir Topaz was his name. It's not the same rhyme scheme. It's not the same meter. It's the equivalent. We don't get the joke. It's the equivalent of if somebody said, why don't you write a poem or recite a poem, and you did a limerick. Do we all know what a limerick is? There was a, it always starts with that way. There was a young, da 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 and it's usually some silly joke, and it's low class. It's just kind of low class poetry. So is this. Our creator of the entire book, the character who is him in the book, tells the lowest class sort of poetry. <laughs> I mean, it's really very funny. And, and he's so uncreative that he can't make up anything, so he uses everything that's already been said. So for example, the host describes him up here. He says, there's something elvish in his countenance. And then he's got an elf queen. Uh, he throws an elf queen. He says, the birds are singing because it's spring while they're traveling. Um, he, he includes a romance. You know, this guy's in love with the elvish queen, just like the knight did in the knight's tale. Um, then he throws in malarkey like this. Uh, his lips were red as a rose. Gag. I mean, that was old then. Oh my gosh, this is just worn out. And then, listen to this. Tell me while I arm romances such as may befall to prince and pope and cardinal. <laughs> so I missed the boat. Popes and cardinals aren't supposed to have romances. It just, it doesn't make any sense. It's in bad poetry and it's ridiculous and it doesn't make any sense. And he just goes on and on. Yeah. Until the host says, well, you stow it. Yeah. You to death with your illiterate stuff, your illiterate stuff. Yeah. I like that. By God, he said, put plainly in a word, your dreary rhyming isn't worth the turd. Yeah. But he tells him you shall no longer rhyme. Oh, yay. Okay, I'm going to give you a prose, super long. It's not in your book. It's pages and pages and pages of saints. Take that. Um, yeah, it goes on and on. This is the joke of the tale of Sir Topaz. And everybody would have gotten the joke that the, the guy who made up everything and wrote all of this poetry in the story is so terrible that no one can stand his story. Um, yeah, okay. That's all I have to say about the tale of Sir Topaz. Just to make sure that we get, it's highly funny. Um, yeah, it's like if Shakespeare were a character in one of his plays and they just kept making fun of him. Like he, he was the, the comic relief because he was an idiot. But he's the mastermind of the whole thing. This is the joke. Okay. 
But I want to give plenty of time for the wife of Bath because <laughs> she requires plenty of time. But let's talk about the nun's priest tale. This is probably, you guys have known this story for ages. Very much like an Aesop's fable, isn't it? You know, what, okay, somebody in one, in two sentences, can somebody give me the plot of the nun's priest tale? What basically happens? Just limiting it to the action. Oh, the action? Just the action, like the basic plot. Um, the, there's like a fox, like, it comes by and it's a, it's a little bit character for chickens. Yes. And, uh, Fox tells the chicken to like sing a song. He kind of coaxes him, saying like, "Oh yeah, you, you sing really beautifully." And so he starts singing, but he closes his eyes when he does it, and the fox gets him. And uh, yeah, one time. Yeah, and then the fox runs off with him, and then he dishes it back to the fox. Right? He says, "Oh, you know what? If I were you, I just..." I just yell at all of them and say, you're never going to catch me now. I'm almost to the woods. And of course, when he opens his mouth to do so, the chicken runs away, chicken runs away out of his mouth. The end. This is the entire plot. <coughs> is this story limited to only this plot? Because we could probably tell that in about a page and a half, two pages. Um, so I looked up this statistic. That story is 10% 10% of what's in the poem. The, the actual action is only 10% of what gets talked about in the nun's priest tale. In the meantime, what are some other things that they talk about? Do you remember? Dreams. dreams. The philosophy of dreams. Are dreams real? Are dreams not real? It goes on and on. Pertolote, the hen. And by the way, they're chickens. <laughs> Having a philosophical discussion about dreams. Just saying. It's so weird just to read about like the hotel guy being like, oh, see, oh yeah, oh yeah, your friend here is just gonna die, and then they're gonna throw his body into this cart, and they're gonna, and yes. the guy's like, okay, goes out to the cart, finds the guy, and yeah. the people, and they're like, oh. and, and what's the point of that whole story? Alex, what's the point of that story? Why is it thrown in there? Do you remember? Because it's get. We, remember Herodotus? Does anybody remember Herodotus? So, um, because dreams. So, so Pertolote, the chief hen, you know, says, oh, change clear. You're a loser. You're a loser. You know, dreams, that's just indigestion. You know, I'm going to go. When we get up, I'm going to go pick some medicinal herbs because I know all about it. And you're going to, you're going to pick some herbs. You're going to be fine. We just need, you know, like a laxative or something. We need to purge because you need to get rid of whatever it is you ate that's giving you bad dreams. And he's like, no, I am telling you. I am telling you, dreams, he's, look at, you know, Nebuchadnezzar and look at Joseph. And he's giving all these examples. And then he says, you know, once upon a time, there's this guy, these two guys that went to this town and they had to stay in different places. And one of them was being murdered, but the other one was having dreams. Oh, help me. I'm being murdered. And then he didn't go, oh, it's too late. I've been murdered. But if you go out to the cart in the morning, you'll find my body. This is like, ah. Uh, uh, the chickens are having this conversation. And, okay, here's the joke. There's jokes buried in a bunch of these. The joke is, uh, the obvious joke that they're chickens. <clears throat> and chickens don't really discuss Cato and ancient Rome and, and not that I know of. They probably do. We just can't understand it. Just it's unclear. Over. Unclear. But... Every rhetorical device that a kid would learn in school when they learned rhetoric in the Middle Ages is in this story. So digressio, I digression. So to go and, you know, go along. Because this is one place where he starts debating whether or not women are evil. <laughs> right? Um, uh Oh, oh, woman's counsel is so often cold. A woman's counsel brought us first to woe, made Adam out of paradise to go, where he had been so merry, so well at ease. But for, but for I know not whom it may displease if I suggest that women are to blame. Pass over that. I only speak in game. Read the authorities to know about what has been said of women. You'll find out. These are the cock's words, not mine, I'm giving. 
I think no harm of any woman living. This is a little digression by Chaucer, the, well, by the nun's priest, all right, saying, oh, you know, well, some people say that women have bad advice. In other words, Pertolote, in this case, has bad advice. This is a digression. Examples. That whole long story about the two uh, travelers is an example. We have um, description, descriptio. Listen to this descriptio. And remember, he's a chicken. Grim as a lion's was his manly frown. He's a chicken. As on his toes he sauntered up and down, he scarcely deigned to set his foot to ground, and every time a seed of corn was found, he gave a chuck, and up his wives ran all. Thus royal as a prince who strides his hall, leave we this chanticleer engaged on feeding, and past the adventure that was breeding. He's like a lion with his manly... Have you ever looked at a chicken's face? Manly frown? No, just kind of... You know, just clueless. This is a chicken's face. Um, so we have this description, but it's way out of proportion to the thing that's being described. It's rhetoric that's over the top. It's like maybe a school kid who's taking it a little too far. Do you see what I mean? Like, is this is a school, because these would be school exercises. Like, put, put all, just like I used to do, like I do to you guys, put in the parallelism, put in the antithesis, like, put in a digression, put in an example, put in, and oh, we're going to put them all in. Now, the fox, we turn our attention to the fox. Okay, remember, what do foxes do? They steal chickens. This is, this is the job description, right? But listen to this fox. Oh, false assassin, lurking in thy den. Oh, new Iscariot, new Ganelon. Oh, oh, Greek Sinon, thou whose treachery won Troy town and brought it utterly to sorrow. Who is Iscariot? Uh, Judas. Who is Ganelon? The evil prince, king guy, uh, I don't know. Who did what to who? Uh, the, the uncle of Roland. Who? Threw Roland under the bus. See, we're part of the conversation. We know Ganelon. Greek Sinon, some of you might remember from the Aeneid. He's, he's the guy who convinced them to take the Trojan horse in Detroit. He's a fox. He's not Judas Iscariot. He's, not get, he's just eating a chicken. <laughs> but it's way out of proportion, right? Um, uh, and then, and then they, 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 uh, the nun's priest goes off and has a digression about God's foreknowledge and predestination, whether or not this was predestined to happen or whether it just happened. Every rhetorical device you can throw in, the nun's priest throws in. Um, Say that again. Yeah, or or just mimicking mimicking what every school kid did. Every kid would would um. So here's an here's a uh, over the top description descriptio of the mo the fox is running off with Chanticleer, and of course there's a hubbub. Oh shoot, the fox is running off with Chanticleer. Let's go get you know rescue him. But listen to how it's described. So, sure, never was such a cry or lamentation was made by ladies of high Trojan station when Ilium fell, and Pyrrhus with his sword grabbed Priam by the beard, their king and lord, and slew him there, as the Aeneid tells, as what was uttered by those hens. Their yells surpassed them all in palpitating fear when they beheld the rape of Chanticleer. Dame Pertolote emitted sovereign shrieks that echoed up in anguish to the peaks louder than those extorted from the wife of Hasdrubal when he had lost his life and Carthage all in flame and ashes lay. Hasdrubal was one of the Carthaginian generals during the Punic Wars. She was so full of tor torment and dismay that in the very flame she chose her part and burnt to ashes with a steadfast heart. Hasdrubal's wife just jumped in the fire instead of let the Romans take her. Oh, woeful hens, louder your shrieks and higher than those of Roman matrons. When the fire consumed their husbands, senators of Rome, when Nero burned 
their city and their home. Beyond a doubt that Nero was their bail. Oh my goodness, they're Dickens. Okay, so it goes on. He says, he says, the dog's running. The, the, the chickens are squawking. The dog is running. The lady of the farm lady and her daughters are running. The, he says, the bees come out of their hive. Everybody's in an uproar because Chanticleer's been kidnapped. And then, guys, listen to this. Except, Rhett, did you want to say something? I was just going to say, no matter how hungry I was about the dog, that the dog sit down. <laughs> <laughs> if it's about that big a hubbub. All right, here we go. So hideous was the noise. God bless us all. Jack Straw and all his followers in their brawl were never half so shrill for all their noise when they were murdering those Flemish boys as that day's hue and cry upon the fox. Okay, you're like, Jack Straw means nothing because it's been Hasdrubal, Aeneid, Nero, and Jack Straw. Who's Jack Straw? Well, if you go to the footnotes in the back of the book, page 229, let me read to you what it says. Jack Straw was one of the leaders of the riots in London during the Peasants' Revolt of 1381 according to Walsingham's Chronicle. He and his gang massacred a number of Flemings in the Ventry, and he was later captured and decapitated. 1381. It's like the year 1400. This happened 20 years ago for Chaucer. You're like, oh, it was like, it was like, uh, you know, the fall of Troy. It was like, uh, the Carth Carthage falling. It was like uh, Nero burning Rome. You know, it was like Jack Straw in the Peasants' Revolt. You know that guy who massacred a bunch of people 20 years ago and we cut his head off? Okay, here's what I'm, here's what I'm telling you guys. What if we were writing some over-the-top poem and we said, oh, and the the dust clouds were like, uh, you know, the army of Alexander going across the plain, and 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 and, and then we threw in the twin towers falling. And you know, you're you're reading, and it's funny. You know, it's like, oh, this is the. And then, wait a minute, I know somebody that was killed in that. And I just don't think Chaucer was. I don't think he made a mistake. For some reason, the nun's priest is telling this story, and he's got this over-the-top crazy stuff, and then suddenly said more. And I don't, I'm going to tell you flat out, I don't know why. I mean, we, we can speculate. Like, what was he trying, what effect is he trying to get from me? What effect, they say, so she wanted to try it out on me, and it, I think it was true. She said, something is not humorous until a good amount of time passes. And how much time, I don't know. But she said, okay, this is kind of a sick joke. Nonetheless, it kind of, I sickly find it slightly amusing. So it's just one line. Yes, yes, Mrs. Lincoln, but how was the play? Okay, so we're laughing a little bit. Okay, why? Because we get the joke. Okay, Abraham Lincoln's like way, way long time ago for all of us. He's, he's just like somebody we see in picture and we know something about him. And so you can imagine Mrs. Lincoln trying to explain, yes, yes, but how's the play? But he said to her, he, the professor said to my roommate, but we can't say, yes, yes, Mrs. Kennedy, but how was Dallas? And we certainly can't say, yeah, but how was your trip to New York otherwise? That's not funny. It's not funny yet. At what point it becomes funny? At what point? I mean, some of you are snick, but I, I think it's because of the way I'm building it up. So, so Chaucer's giving us stuff that, oh yeah, yeah, like like the Trojan War, like Nero, like uh, that massive revolt and massacre twenty years ago. Suddenly, I'm not laughing anymore. Yeah, Carson. Mm -hmm. Indeed. 
we just don't think things are funny until a little bit of time has passed. And uh, so we can say, we can talk about Lincoln, but we can't talk about Kennedy. So like the greater the offense, the longer time it's going to take. Probably so. Yeah. Like and, and some things will never be funny. Uh, Pearl Harbor is never going to be funny. No. But it might get used in a thing like this someday. You know, and the roar was like the planes over Pearl Harbor. We're not there yet where we'd say, oh, yeah, the over-the-top, like, Nero burning Rome or the maybe Trojan maybe War. Maybe it's like it's more out. In Europe, if it Yes. It might depend on who, who you are. Oh, no. What changes over time? You know, like, I know time goes past, but, like, less member of the person. I would say if you lose, you lose the knowledge of the person, you lose, well, I would say it's just a disconnect from the event that changes over time. Because, like, if it happened recently, like, you might know people who, like, remember the event, or, like, what uh, Kyle was saying, like, Pearl Harbor probably, it'll take less time for the Europeans to make light of that because it didn't affect them. So I think it's just, a dis like, how disconnected you are from the event itself, and time just does that naturally. And this is one of those things. It's like, if this is an event where people die, and you either knew people who knew someone to die, you can't make that joke around. It's going to touch a soft spot. On, um, it's going to like, it's going to mess with them. Okay, you can't make those jokes around. Them. But yeah. if you were to make a joke around someone like me who has absolutely zero um, <laughs> connection to yeah, the event, yeah. Like, I don't know how bad that was. I didn't see it on TV. And, uh, um, your grandfather also said that. What? Like, what? Did people uh, say all yeah. yeah. people's? Let's like, say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't affect you as much because you don't have a connection. Yes. Yeah. I think, see, I think Chaucer, I think Chaucer's ring is really interesting. Um, and I, I'm starting to think that Chaucer is not only a, an author, of a of a bunch of poems, but also a philosopher, in a, in a sort of way. This is philosophy at its finest. He's he's putting in he's putting in an early event. Think about it. He's putting in an early event to make a point. What is his point here? Maybe his point is to say, without saying it directly, that as time goes by, we make light of situations. But some things will never change, of course. Perhaps we make light of um, the little dramas that we see every day that for the participants are not funny. So Chanticleer and Pertolote are not laughing. This is life and death. But perhaps when we look on, and we all do it, it's not a good thing, but I think we all do it. It's, <clears throat> it's easy to see someone else's misfortune, but it doesn't touch you. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying we laugh at it. I don't mean that. But I mean, we also don't gr grieve in the same extent that the people it's happening to are grieving. Um, what, maybe, we, maybe we can't. Maybe that's something we can develop over time. But, you know, maybe we're surrounded by Chanticleer, Pertolote dramas that for the people are very, very real. Um, and Chanticleer and Pertolote are people. I keep saying they're chickens, but obviously they're not. Do you know what I mean in this story? They're given every characteristic of human beings, including their fear, terror, um, resourcefulness. Um, but we don't always appreciate what's happening to other people because it's not happening to us. Yeah, Rhett. Go ahead, Rhett. Um, I wonder if it's also like there's only a certain amount of time. And I also, it also feels very like, counterproductive to your situation. But like there's only a certain amount of time that we, like, humans can be, like, really sad about something and just mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. And at some point, it's like, okay, I'm more than enough. And then I feel like, kind of like with 9-11, there's a lot of people who's like, well, my brother or whatever, like, was there and died or all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And so, like, it's really not enough time to, like, mm -hmm. make jokes about it and mm -hmm. stuff. But I feel like we're kind of at, like, the first, like, five years, six, seven, eight, uh, like probably around somewhere in there was like everybody was still pretty it was just, 
it was like still really hard. But I feel like we're just kind of in that goal, like just like, like don't make jokes, but mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be sad about it on that day, but it's still really not like people aren't mm -hmm. like crying every single day. That yeah. Really like it's 20, it was 20 yes. years ago. Well, here's or, new, yeah. yeah. So my mom, my mom was 19 years old when Kennedy was assassinated. And this is where we went to see the eclipse. My mom's be 78 this summer. Um, and so I think as long as there are people like my mom, so you guys, you know, Mrs. Gamble knows it. Um, for us, we will always remember where we were on 9-11. And I, that's kind of burned in my memory, turning on the TV and seeing what happened. This, doesn't, this is not a memory you have. But as long as people like me are still alive that have that, I remember that shocking moment. See, because I wasn't born when Kennedy was assassinated. But through my mom, you see, she tells the story like I would tell the 9-11 story. I remember where I was when I heard the news that the president was dead. Because people loved Kennedy. Kennedy was very popular with people at the time. So it was quite a shock. <clears throat> and so maybe you just have to wait until, you know, maybe part of the passage of time is until all of those people who have that moment in them, um, th they have to be gone. And so that eventually no one's left. And it is only an event in a history book for everyone who's now currently alive. I mean, I don't know. This is like the philosophy of humor or something. I, I don't know. But, but I think you're right. I mean, there's, but, but where the tipping point is, I mean, can you say when the last person dies that has any memory? And no, I mean, it's just, and, and sometimes there are some things that maybe you can start to joke about even while there are still people living. Yeah, because they're, <clears throat> that generation is aging or whatever. So I'm guessing that it's going to be another 30 years before, I, and I, and like we said, there's some things that maybe you can't ever joke just about like, like the fall of Rome and all that kind of stuff like there might be a few people out there but I still can't imagine that there's any majority but like America like it doesn't matter to us and yeah no like, we can we can make jokes about Rome yeah, with impunity it's like, it's, it's, even though like that day was like, mm -hmm. so many people died like you think about like, how many people were just killed mm -hmm. and like you're like you kind of step back and go oh that's actually pretty terrible. Yeah, like, yeah. Since we have no connection, like, you could almost, you could make a joke around almost anybody. So, you know, a series of unfortunate events. If you have been fortunate enough to read a series of unfortunate events, um, in the Austere Academy, Vice Principal Nero, Vice Principal Nero, who makes the students listen to his violin playing, and it's really, really bad, but you're not allowed to leave. And it's hilarious. It's hilarious. But <laughs> Nero is not funny. Do you know what I mean? But this book is very, very funny. And so, um, but you can you can laugh about it now. But I think I think it's true. But uh, maybe it's something you've never thought about before. What what makes something funny? Go ahead, Ethan. And then we're going to move on to the wife of Bath. Um, maybe either this is a philosophical question that needs to bring into the table, or maybe he's just disconnected, um, like emotionally. Maybe he doesn't understand the concept of like you shouldn't do that socially. Maybe, Maybe, although I will throw this little historical tidbit in. I did tell you that Chaucer was a government official, and apparently during the Peasants' Revolt, he was in some small danger of being attacked. Um, and they went through a bunch of stuff, but like kind of goes back to like that. They, humans can only grieve for so long. So like, if their way of making the situation, like making light of the situation, is like if the person whose brother died uh, made a joke about 9/11, you can't be like, oh my gosh, you can't make like. Yeah, yeah. It does depend on the source. Yeah. Mrs. Gamble wanted to add something. I was just curious if the chick and the Shenflyer and the other name, uh, if those are linked to any actual historical people that they kind of might be hinting at? Not that I know of, but I don't know. That's a good question. So, yeah, uh, Kyle. Going, going back to making jokes, just for a second. Okay. Uh, with, we can make, we can sort of now make jokes about the bomb dropped upon uh, on 
Japan. Mm-hmm. It doesn't really affect us. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's getting <laughs> I don't know. I know. Like, Although, like, so. Like, so like, no. like, with the first one, I would say that I was. That's a, uh, it's it's getting to the point. But on the borderline, it's really hard because, like, there's, like, I don't know. I don't know. That, that's a hard one. All right, here, you guys, why don't you take this into your lunch hour? You can debate for the rest of the day what is what can be made fun of and what can't be made fun of. Because we can't leave out the wife of Bath. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, I don't think we're, she's fair game. So, um, all right, let's. Oh, you did. Oh, you missed out. Okay. So, why? Why is she an authority on marriage? She's been good. She's been all around. She's been all around. Five husbands. I really think that that makes her less of an authority on marriage. Um, possibly. She says, she starts out her very long prologue by saying, you know, you know, some women are called to be nuns. Oh, not me. I'm, I'm on the lookout for another one um, whenever he comes around. Um, she says, um, now, gentlemen, all on and tell my tale as I hope to drink good wine and ale. I'll tell the truth. Those husbands that I had, three of them were good and two were bad. The three that I call good were rich and old. <laughs> well, okay, you know why rich? Why is old good? Oh, they'll die soon. They'll die soon and leave me their money. Three times. She's been to every shrine. She travels all the time. She's dressed well because her dead husbands, her dead husbands. So how? Okay, we're we're gonna. Her no, no, be, no. They're just old. Um, okay, so. Um, how does she manage the the, the old ones? Particularly, how does she say she manages her husbands? What does she do? What's the key? What's the key to being a successful wife? Um, Seducing your husband to do whatever you want. Yeah, but she does. She does it in a certain way. She gets them to do whatever she wants, but she has a plan. Let me read. Let me read. Um. Okay. Let me make sure I'm starting at the right place. Okay. Listen. I'll tell you how I used to hold them, <clears throat> you knowing women who can understand. First, put them in the wrong and out of hand. No one can be so bold, I mean no man, at lies and swearing as a woman can. This is no news, as you'll have realized, to knowing ones, but to the misadvised. A knowing wife, if she is worth her salt, can always prove her husband is at fault. Even though the fellow may have heard some story told him by a little bird, she knows enough to prove the bird is crazy and get her maid to witness she's a daisy with full agreement, scarce solicited. You know, if he hears rumors about her, a little bird, you know, the metaphor of I heard a rumor, she knows enough to prove the bird's crazy, gets her maid to swear she's a daisy, no matter what she's doing. But listen, here's the sort of thing I said. Now, Sir old dotard, what is that you say? Uh, why is my sister? Time you drop that game. And if I see my gossip or a friend, you scold me like a devil. There's no wind if I as much as stroll towards his house. Then you come home, drunken as a mouse. You mount your throne and preach, chapter and verse, all nonsense. You tell me it's a, you tell me it's a curse to marry a poor woman. She's expensive. Or if her family is wealthy and extensive, you say it's torture to endure her pride and melancholy airs and more beside. And if she has a pretty face, old traitor, you say she's game for any fornicator and ask what likelihood will keep her straight with all those men who lie about in wait. She turns it back on him every time. She complains about anything. It's like, oh, what about you? Are you visiting the neighbor again? Did I see you talking to the maid? You know, I, have, I can't go anywhere. I have no good clothes. Yes. I see a place in the eighth circle. <laughs> I'd have been lost if I'd called a halt. First to the mill is first to grind your corn. I attacked first, and they were overborn. Glad to apologize, and even suing pardon for what they'd never thought of doing. <laughs> this is how she dealt with the first three, the rich old ones. But husband number four, those were her first three. Husband number four. 
funny yeah. because after, yeah. after those, that's when she starts to become the one who's richer than... She um, is. He was a reveler, older. was number four. That is to say, he kept a paramour. He had a girlfriend on the side. Young, strong, and stubborn, I was full of rage and jolly as a magpie in a cage. Play me the harp and I would dance and sing, believe me, like a nightingale in spring, if I had had a draft of tweet and wine. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to skip the fourth guy. Uh, she says, I've, I loved this part. I've had my world in time. I've had my fling. But age that comes to poison everything has taken all my beauty and my pith. Well, let it go. The devil go there with. Uh, so number fifth, number five. Now of my fifth, last husband, let me tell. God never let his soul be sent to hell. And yet he was my worst. And many a blow he struck me, still can ache along my row of ribs and will until my dying day. All right. Does anybody remember what was happening when she hooked up with this guy, Johnny? Where she she'd known him a little bit, but they met really met at an event. Yeah, like, the, funeral the funeral of her former husband. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I love this. Okay, listen to this. Um, she she had met him, and she suggested, "Were I ever free and made a widow, he should marry me." And certainly, I do not mean to boast, I ever was more provident than most in marriage matters and other such. I never think a mouse is up to much that only has one hole in all the house. You know, you got to have something on the back burner. You only got one hole. Maybe not much of a mouse, are you? So she sold this guy, you know, if I'm ever a widow. Um, so, so, and it's funny, listen to this part. She's telling how she dreamed about this guy. And then she stops and listen to this that Chaucer stuck in. Well, let me see. What had I to explain? Ah, aha, by God, I got the thread again. She loses her track of, she loses her train of thought in the poem. She's not young anymore. Okay. When my fourth husband lay upon his bier, I wept all day and looked as drear as drear, as widows must, for it is quite in place. And with a handkerchief, I hid my face. All the neighbors round inventing sorrow. And one of them, of course, was handsome Johnny. So help me God, I thought he looked so bonny behind the coffin. Heaven, what a pair of legs he had. Such feet. <laughs> so clean. Oh, I gave my whole heart up for him to hold. He was, I think, some 20 winters old. And I was 40 then, to tell the truth. <laughs> She's the rich old wife. The Chaucer storybook. Yeah. His legs, his legs at the, at the at the funeral of her husband. So so um apparently Johnny had a book that he liked to read, and it was like all the wicked things women have ever done. And she got so sick of it once she just went over and ripped a couple pages out and threw them. And she said, "That's why I'm deaf in one ear. She's deaf in one ear. He knocked her hearing out in one ear, but she still misses him." Dear Johnny, well, she, dear she Johnny. Back, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. She she punches him back. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But listen, uh, go ahead, Alex. But let me read the end of it. Oh oh yeah, oh yeah. But as soon as he gets, you know, you know, like oh yeah, so, I can't resist you. Oh yeah. You know, it's, well, here's the thing. It's not, people died a lot in the Middle Ages. I don't know how to say it like that. People got sick. It's just, you know, people died. But she says, see, okay, I'm going to read this. This is the end of her prologue. And then you tell me what is appropriate about the story she told. Maybe you already know. We had a mort of trouble. We had a mort of trouble in heavy weather, but in the end we made it up together. He gave the bridle over to my hand gave me the government of house and land, of tongue and fist, indeed of all he got, I made him burn that book upon the spot. And when I'd mastered him, and out of deadlock, secured myself the sovereignty and wedlock, and when he said, my own and truest wife, do as you please for all the rest of life, but guard your honor and my good estate. From that day forward, there was no debate. 
So help me God, I was as kind to him as any wife from Denmark to the rim of India, and is true, and he to me. And I pray God that sits in majesty to bless his soul and fill it with his glory. Now, if you'll listen, I'll tell my story. What? She ends with this note. What is her story about? What is the moral of her story that she tells? Like her, story her, her story. The story she tells to for the contest. Instead of leave their heart instead. Because, okay. Um, because um, the knight and the um, um, the old woman or whatever, um, you, you shouldn't look for the physical qualities of a person, but you should see their heart. Okay. I agree. And this is the lofty. This is the lofty moral. Now let's look for one a little less. Ethan's being very moral and on you know taking the high ground. Good for you. But let's look for one. What is it women really want? What's the answer to the question? Now, if you if you read the story, then what's control the men? So her story is all about a knight, right? Who in the story he assaults, he assaults a woman, and they said, "Okay, we're going to execute you." And the queen says, "No, let's force him to spend a year interviewing people and find out what women really want." And if you don't bring me the right answer, Sir, we will execute you. So he's got to go around and beg women, please, 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 will you tell me what women really want? And he finds out money, fame, glory, nice clothes, whatever. And then till this old hag, oh, I can tell you what women want. Do you get the joke? She ended her prologue saying, my marriage to Johnny went good after I'd mastered him. When he gave the government into my hand, she tells the story of her life. What do women really want? Be in charge. And I don't know. The ladies in this room, we can all just keep our own counsel, whether or not that's the correct answer or not. We don't have to share. That's what uh, God said at the Garden of Eden, that the life will... You will desire him, but he will... His rule will be over you. you yes, yeah. but he will yeah. be, but yes. So it, it's pretty also um, really funnily. Funnily is not a word, I'm sure. It is Sounds like it's like a funnel. Yeah. It's not like a funnel at all. Um, it's humorously. Humorously, because funnily is just not a word. Um, but it should be. If you guys help me, we can turn it into a word if you start using it. Um, very humorously, she tells a story where the answer is the way she's lived her life, by bossing men around, by getting the control, by managing them, by making them think they're wrong, by being in charge. Um, I also, so we only have three minutes left. Um, so this, this is the wife of Bath. This is also a pretty famous one. And this was also, those of you who read King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table with me might recognize this as the Lady Ragnall. The story of the Lady Ragnall and Sir Gawain, um, the old biddy that he was forced to marry because uh, King Arthur was looking for the answer to the question, what do women want? And she knew the answer. These stories just circulate. You know, the same, but, but Chaucer, you know, being the brilliant guy he is, puts his little stamp on it, you know, by inventing a woman like the wife of Bath to tell the story. And then we see how humorous it is that her story is all about herself and what she really wants. Um, I also said, read his retractions. It was just a page at the end. Chaucer, for whatever reason, towards the end of his life, decided to release a statement saying, I wrote some immoral things and I'm sorry. I love this for some reason. Can you imagine a modern movie ma filmmaker or, or writer aging and then just doing a public statement? I am very sorry that I made this movie. It was a wicked movie. Nobody does that anymore. But he listed specifically the things he wrote that he thought were not very good. And I mean, they were good literature, not very moral. And he said, the Canterbury Tales, those that tend towards sin. Now, 
I have avoided reading with you the, <laughs> the ones that tend towards sin. I'm just going to say, oh, I'm being recorded. Um, yeah. I can't stop you from reading the rest of the Canterbury Tales. We'll just say you have a copy, and some of them are a little, yeah. Um, some of them are, are very much, they have a lot to do. They're like a five-year-old boy potty humor. We'll just say. Some of them involve other shenanigans that we just don't usually read with school kids. So I'll let, I'm going to tell you which one's which. Um, but um, the partner's tale uh, was also in the Chaucer storybook. Uh, and this, uh, you might remember, this is the one, the, the death. The, the, you know, we're going to go kill death. Where is death? And um, they, they, they go looking for death. And this guy says, oh, yeah, death. I'll, I'll tell this real briefly because it's an awesome story, but I can tell it short. Yeah, death? You want to get rid of death? I think you'll find him up there on that hill. So they climb up the hill. There's a treasure. These three guys find a treasure. Like, whoa, I didn't find death, but awesome. Oh, you know what? If we want to get this home, we'll split it three ways. If we want to get this home, we got to wait till night because people will see us and they'll think we stole it. So what? So you, you, let's draw straws. You go to town and get us some drinks and snacks because we're going to camp here by the treasure and then come back. So the guy leaves and the two are talking and like, you know, if we split it two ways, we each get more. When he comes back, you grab him and I'll plant the. Yeah. How, the how about back. we get rid of him? And then it's 50, 50. It's like you're on. So the guy goes off to the store in the meantime, he's like, yeah, uh, I'll have a bottle of that rat poison. And he poisons two. So it's, it's an awesome story. Um, uh, but part the partner, you know, his his business is selling papal pardons and getting people worked up about sin. So he wants to scare them. You know, he wants them to think about death. Death is just around the corner. And um, so anyway, they're fun. Um, read more. Don't read more. It's fine. Next week, we are going to dig into Hamlet. It's one of my favorite Shakespeare plays. So I'm very excited. Otherwise, have a good week and I'll see you next time. <laughs> I'm going to now.